Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Dean Salon of 2022. Our Dean Salon series highlights the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs of our distinguished faculty. The series explores how the humanities deepen our understanding of ideas and social forms that shape our lives. This exploration is how we make the work and ourselves ready for change and build a better world. I have the honor of introducing our speakers, but first let me share a brief overview of this evening's program. Dan Brudney and Lainey Ross will talk with us about two important moral issues raised by modern medicine and the ethics of balancing personal choice with the needs of society. After their conversation, they will be delighted to answer any questions you have. Dan and Lainey are looking forward to your thoughts. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions at any time you like during the event, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Now I'm pleased to introduce this evening's speakers, Daniel Brudney and Lainey Ross. Daniel Brudney is the Florin Harrison Pugh Professor in the Department of Philosophy and Associate Faculty in the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Dan writes and teaches in political philosophy, bioethics, philosophy and literature, and the philosophy of religion. He is the author of Marx's Attempt to Leave Philosophy and numerous articles in moral and political philosophy. Lainey Ross is the Carolyn and Matthew Buxbaum Professor of Clinical Ethics, Professor in the Departments of Pediatric Medicine, Surgery and the College, Co-Director of the Institute for Translational Medicine, and Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago. Her areas of research include ethical and policy issues in organ transplantation, pediatrics, genetics, and human subjects protections and research ethics. She's the author of no fewer than five books, two focused on pediatric ethics, two focused on transplantation ethics, and one focused on defining death. She's currently writing a book on sibling obligations in healthcare that is funded by the National Library of Medicine. And now I'm very excited to turn over the virtual podium to Dan and Lainey, and I believe Dan will kick off our discussion. Thank you, Dean Robertson. Thanks very much. I'm excited to be here and to discuss these issues um, with Lainey. Thank you. In setting things up, I wanted to just sort of make two points of clarification to begin with. One is just to say the kind of to talk about the kind of conversation that we're having. It's in what philosophers um, call applied ethics, and both of the terms are important. So it's about ethics, which is, a, therefore, it's about um, what moral norms and values and ultimately principles are appropriate for a given area. And it's also, however, what we do with these things when we try to apply them to the very messy real world. Um, we can disagree with one another at either level. Um, we can decide, find that we disagree with one another about the relevant kinds of moral norms or values for a given area, about how we weight them uh, and balance them. And even if we agree at that level, we could disagree um, about what's involved when we try to put uh, these principles into some sort of institutional framework so that they actually regulate individual human behavior. Um, it's really important to try to keep track of where we are so that we know both Laney and I and all of us here um, know what we are agreeing or disagreeing on. So that's the first clarification. The second has to do with our first topic. We're going to be talking tonight um, about uh, two things. The first will be whether we should take a patient's vaccine status into account that is their COVID vaccine status into account when listing the patient for an organ transplant or perhaps for some other scarce medical resource. The second topic will be that of physician-assisted suicide. 
So the first topic I just want to be clear is not about the general issue of vaccine or say mask mandates. That's clearly very important. It could take us um, more than this session to go into it, but it would also require us to have a lawyer on the panel because when it comes to the nitty gritty about vaccine and mask mandates, it's often in practice a matter of statutory or constitutional interpretation. And those things are outside Laney's and my skill sets. So um, our topic is a little narrower and we really just wanna get clear, as I say, on what the issues are. So turning to it, I'm going to just point out, again, thinking of this as applied ethics, that there's a general moral question that's at stake here. And that's the question of whether we all have an obligation to take care of our own health in more or less easy ways. I don't mean um, that we have to do nothing but uh, uh, eat our vegetables uh, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that we never you know, consume sweets or fun things, but rather do we have an obligation to do the things that are easy so that we become less likely um, to add to the demand for some very important and fundamentally scarce medical resource, such as an organ, or possibly these days during the pandemic, an ICU bed in a hospital that's overtaxed. That's the general moral question. The more particular moral question that we wanna get at here is whether if there is this general obligation, if you think there is one, does it entail a particular obligation to get vaccinated against COVID? Um, and that's, um, so you could of course think there is a general obligation, but wonder whether it cashes itself out with regard to the obligation to get vaccinated. Then there's the more practical question. Um, even if there is a moral obligation to get vaccinated, is it permissible for healthcare institutions, hospitals say, um, to take vaccine status into account when they're distributing a scarce medical resource. It would be perfectly coherent to, to, to think that people have a moral obligation to make sure they're vaccinated, but think it wrong for institutions to take that into account. Just to lay my own cards on the table, um, I do think we have the general moral obligation in question. I think it's part of what we owe to one another as members of a society. And I also think it would be proper for healthcare institutions to take certain failures to meet the obligation, including a failure to get vaccinated against COVID into account. But of course, as I recognize, you might agree with me on the first claim or disagree, but even if you agree on the first claim, you might disagree about the second. And now I'm going to kick it over to Lane. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for including me in this panel. So the first thing, the reason it's so important to be talking about vaccine mandates in the context of organ transplantation is that organs are scarce and the uh, supply um, is greatly, uh, the, the demand is much greater than the supply. And so that's one of the reasons why we're worried about uh, individuals who don't get vaccinated, maybe placing themselves at risk, maybe placing their caregivers at risk, and are also placing, in a sense, the scarce resource at risk. The, um, there's another obligation, though, and it's not just the obligation of what we have to each other, but there's also, in a sense, the physician's obligation to, to patients in general. And I would say that that obligation is actually a fiduciary obligation, and that physicians have fiduciary ob obligations to act in the best interest of their patient. And this is uh, very stressful in the public health realm because we're taking care of the patient in the room and there's that whole crowd who's outside of the room. And so we have this tension. Um, and yet as physicians, we're really taught to focus on the patient in front of us. And so the patient who needs an organ needs the organ, whether or not they've been vaccinated. Uh, in general, when we, we talk about who we're going to vaccinate, we, we talk about some minimal threshold of benefit that they have to achieve. And I guess my position would be as long as somebody meets that threshold, uh, even if they don't have a vaccine, meaning how long they can benefit from that organ, I would see no reason to change their status in any way. I guess in the way that philosophers do things, I'm going to ask you whether certain hypothetical cases um, would trouble you. Um, and again, and as uh, the issue is less whether we want to put um, individual physicians on the spot than whether we want to have some form of rule 
that um, healthcare institutions impose um, that institutions will sim- uh, individual clinicians will simply apply. But suppose that someone willfully did something after um, to um, destroy a transplanted kidney that they had. They were just sort of, they, they decided that they wanted to take they, uh, some sort of toxin that destroyed the kidney. And then they get come back asking for a transplant. Um, would you think that if the kidneys are in scarce supply, that the fact that they've done something to actually un- undermine the health of the existing kidney is a relevant consideration in where they go on the transplant list, given that, of course, if they get a kidney, someone else will not, and so, um, and someone else ultimately might die. So I'm, I'm pressing you that uh, on the thought that what we do with that scarce resource and how we act um, to be good stewards of it is a morally relevant fact. It is a morally relevant fact, and, and, and you've given sort of one end of, the, uh, of an example, but the more common example, unfortunately, is that um, the individual who is non adherent to their immunosuppressive drugs. And the reason that's really unfortunate is the way our system works is that individuals um, have to pay for their immunosuppression after several years. Um, originally, it's covered by some legislation, but then they have to pay for it. And it's about $20,000 a year. And so the most common reason why someone is not a good steward of their organ, particularly kidneys, um, is because they can't afford the immunosuppression. So in my world, I would argue that we have, and if we're going to give people um, scarce resources, we have a real obligation to help them be good stewards. And we're failing in that regard. And I think that's really important because when you look at the social factors around why people um, lose their organs, there are a lot of social factors. And uh, there's uh, some good studies that Karen Layden, actually a graduate of the University of Chicago College, um, has shown that they actually lead to huge disparities um, on the basis of socioeconomic education and race and ethnicity. So I really worry as we talk about good stewardship. So practical even if I agree with you philosophically that we should be taking that into consideration. But so I certainly agree that we need to be careful in any rules that we would impose that would penalize people um, for failure to be a good steward of an organ, that we're thinking about what's relatively easy for them to do. And that's why the vaccine situation seems such a pointed one. Um, because it is, at least for most people, easy to get a vaccine. The vaccines are safe. And moreover, the decision not to get a vaccine is a repeated decision. I would feel rather differently if, you know, the vaccine truck came through the neighborhood only once. And if for one reason or another, you didn't grab your vaccine, then I would then say, well, um, that's a different kind of conduct on your part than repeatedly, so to speak, um, not getting a vaccine. So it's it's a um, in in our private conversations, when you use the um, phrase minimal Samaritanism, um, and I think that's a superb phrase, and I think it does apply to this case um, where um, it takes so little for us, so to speak, um, to do something which not only benefits us but really more to the point here, um, uh, is a way of benefiting others. Clearly, um, the concept of uh, minimally Samaritan makes sense, and yet there are other ways for risk mitigation. So the question is, if I refuse the vaccine, are there other things that I can do that sort of even out the risk? So if I'm able to work from home, and if I'm able to have all my food delivered in, and so that I'm really not going out, and that if I go out, I only wear an N95, I stay six feet apart. I don't meet with crowds except outdoors. Um, I can really reduce my risk of getting COVID infection. Um, So I I guess my answer would be vaccines are easy and quick. And yet there are other ways that if somebody is willing to do all of those, that they can, in a sense, even out the scale. 
So here then we get to a further sort of complication when we try to put all, any of these moral considerations into practice, which is that um, when we put them into practice at the level of institutions, this amounts to um, generating a rule. And what we all know about rules in practice is that they're always over and under inclusive. Um, and so often the choice that we have to make in the real world is between rule A, which is over and under inclusive in one way and rule B, which is over and under inclusive in another way and neither is, is going to be perfect. So I wouldn't deny what you say about how there may be patients who are able to mitigate the risk in ways that don't involve having a vaccine. But if as an empirical matter, those are relatively few and far between, it may be that the more defensible rule is the one that requires vaccination to be on the list. Granting that there may be exceptional cases where the patient could minimize risk in some other way, but it's going to be hard to sort of establish that case by case. It's the flip side. So if the patients have an obligation to get vaccinated, I'm also assuming you think that the healthcare team, and I, I mean that broadly, everybody in the hospital who works at a hospital ought to be vaccinated to help protect that individual. I, I don't deny, I mean, not now you're preaching to the choir. I absolutely think that there should be uh, mandates for healthcare workers. Um, to, um, but not just, help, but, but healthcare work is broadly understood. So broadly everybody understood. who works at absolutely. the hospital. Absolutely. So, um, and, and the fact is, is that many hospitals um, said they were going to have those. And yet because of the scarce resource being of personnel, many hospitals have made lots of uh, exemptions. So I guess all I'm saying is if we're willing to make exemptions for each other, uh, can't we make those exemptions for our patients who really, some of whom really are able to mitigate all the risks that we're talking about? because they have the, the ability and flexibility to really isolate and uh, avoid exposure. I mean, here, I'm not quite sure how far we're going to disagree, although I'm, I'm, I'm the principle that if we can't um, successfully do what we ought to be able to do with one group of people, we, um, uh, it would be wrong to do it with another group, it doesn't strike me as a good principle. Uh, I would say, it's, wait, um, we, no, I agree. It's we, not a good, you should be getting, finding ways to get hospital workers um, uh, actually to be vaccinated. Um, even if we can't, the principle that I want to apply to patients seems to me still to apply. But I would argue that our first obligation would be to be focused on the healthcare providers before we start asking our patients to do what we won't do ourselves. Right. Uh, as this, this, I suppose, um, separates us as um, you as a healthcare provider, me as, as simply a consumer. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested in both. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to prioritize one or the other, and I don't see why we would need to. May well, 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 wait, but we did prioritize, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, who were the first people who were offered the vaccines? It wasn't the people who had gotten an organ or who were on the wait list, it was the healthcare community. So we have made that priority. And, and we certainly should, and we should be, and I ha have, would have no problem um, with hospitals um, if they could enforce it. I see no moral issue with actually, uh, you know, making a condition of working in the hospital that you'd be vaccinated. Well, I sort of find the, 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 a vaccine mandate for, for patients who are on the transplant list, interesting, especially now. And by now, I mean at a time where we now have medications that we can give both after exposure, as well as to prevent separate from the vaccine or additive to the vaccine. And um, making it such that if we ensured that all of our patients had available access to healthcare whenever they had an exposure, that we could actually prevent these illnesses um, and prevent them from losing their organs. So I just, I, I guess I wanna keep putting the pressure on the healthcare community over our patients because I feel that we have the responsibility to our patients to help them 
to maximize their ability to take care of their organs. And so I'm willing to put more of the burden on the healthcare community than I am on the patients. So this is where, as I said at the beginning, um, the, the general moral principle can get very messy when we try to apply it to the real world. My concern is not with sort of being morally punitive for people who haven't been vaccinated, but just the stewardship of organs. If there is another effective way for patients to be good stewards of organs other than vaccination, and it's a reliable way, um, ideally it would not be substantially more expensive or difficult than vaccination, but I'm less concerned with the uh, additional financial costs. If there is a way to get patients um, to the point where they are um, good stewards of organs, then whether it's through vaccination or some other way um, seems to me not the key question. Um, so, so there, if we have reached that point um, uh, where these other methods are available and effective and easily to easy to monitor, then you and I are not in disagreement. But let me I see, I was going to shift us a little bit before we shift topics to ask what you think about um, what some people have talked of, namely that it should be in some way a mark against someone who shows up with COVID who is not vaccinated um, and needs a hospital admission um, that they haven't been vaccinated and the hospital is overflowing with patients and indeed is, is delaying all sorts of treatments um, for people who are in great need um, uh, in order to deal with COVID patients. So that the, there the argument is that in a fairly direct way, something that if I'm that patient I've done in the past, namely not get vaccinated and not take sufficient measures not to get the disease um, is having an impact on others, and a, a significant one. If 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 it's if treating me prevents somebody else from getting serious surgery that um, is is really needed, even if it's not absolutely emergent. So this again gets into the tension, right, between the patient in front of me and mm -hmm. the community who's outside the door. And so, from the perspective of this patient is sick. Um, hopefully they're coming in with COVID within the first three to five days so that I can give some post-exposure uh, therapies that will be pretty darn effective. Uh, but I just, I'm not willing to penalize people because if we start penalizing for not getting vaccines, which we can say are easy, there are just a lot of other uh, actions and uh, that, that individuals do that expose themselves to harm. Uh, some of them are like smoking and excessive drinking and excessive eating. Some are depending on what activities we do from skiing and, and riding motorcycles and things of that sort. And I guess from a physician perspective, so putting on my physician hat, the answer is I have obligations to the patient regardless of what caused their illness. So I just, I'm just not willing to penalize them. Well, again, I don't want this to be a matter of not treating someone if we have plenty of resources to treat them. So I have zero question that um, regardless of how you end up with an illness, if we have the resources, um, we should treat. It's more a question of whether treating Jack means that Jill does not get treated because the hospital is so swamped. Um, and at that point, I guess I think it's actually relevant that Jack is there at the hospital because you know, um, he, he refused, as I say, repeatedly to do the easy and safe thing, namely to get vaccinated, whereas Jill, so to speak, has behaved um, in a way that a good citizen should behave. Um, so I, I, I think it's, a, it's the fact that we don't know who Jill is and because Jack shows up there, he is uh, with a face on him, um, it certainly tugs at the heart. I get that. And that's why I don't think this should be uh, a decision that the, uh, the clinician um, on her own should be making. It should be sort of baked into some institutional rule. Um, but Jill is really out there. That is, that's the premise here is that Jill is out there mm -hmm. and she will suffer um, if we treat Jack. So the fact that we have inadequate ICU beds in, in the situation of a surge is a political issue, right? It actually goes way back to the way we design hospitals, the way we design it to, for, for profit versus 
to ensure that we can protect all of our citizens, regardless of what's going to come down the road. Um, no, no debate there. But given the world as it is, it's either Jack or Jill who um, is going to suffer some sort of um, significant medical problem. I guess I'm. Uh, if it were operational, if it were, a, a, if there were a way to do it, I'd find a way to treat Jill rather than Jack. You know, if and when I would have us, and I would have us filming COVID units um, in McCormick Place, right? Which is what we actually did. Oh. We ended up not needing it, but we did create that type of scenario. Um, here, I. It's rare for me. Um, as a philosopher, to be the one who who, who takes puts on the cap of the hard-headed realist, but here I'm going to say yes. In the best of all possible worlds, we would um, have enough healthcare resources to take care of everybody. But it's when we don't that, so to speak, the moral rubber meets the road. And I am concerned with the harms to Jill that are a function of the failure of Jack to get vaccinated. Now, I think. Uh, I, I shouldn't get the last word you should, but then we're going to have to shift our topic. But let, No, let I'm know. totally fine with leaving you with that last word. Um, it's more or less, I, I guess, it, it's just I, I have a problem of um, thinking that there are patients who are more or less blameworthy. Um, and so I'm just, my heart goes out to both patients and we're going to take care of them to the best of our ability. And I think it's just a, a matter of trying to figure out who is really in acute need. And we did a great job. I mean, I just want to give a real shout out to my colleagues in the intensive care unit here at the University of Chicago. We did a great job as well as all across the city in ensuring that everyone got the care that they needed um, during the, the, this pandemic and during this peak. So I'll stop there. <laughs> well, we could clearly go on a long time. But our second topic tonight is physician-assisted suicide. Um, and here, too, uh, it's important to keep separate the general moral issues. And there will also be, um, if we can get to it, an issue of political theory with regard to this issue. It's important to keep those um, issues separate from the question of whether there is a way to permit assisted suicide without incurring unacceptable levels of abuses of it. So that's the, will this work in practice question. Um, now, in setting up this issue, um, I just want to sort of note something that the way the issue is often discussed in the medical philosophical literature, the bioethics literature. And this has to do with focusing on the fact that it is, over the last several generations, become thought to be both legally and morally not only acceptable, but actually required, that if a patient who has what physicians call decisional capacity and is on a ventilator or some other life-sustaining machine, asks to have the life-sustaining machine removed, then we will do that. And this is thought to be morally just, it may be sad in the individual cases, but there's nothing immoral about the um, physician or other healthcare professional um, uh, um, extubating the patient or in some other way um, removing machines um, where the patient, where it's understood that the patient will then die. Many philosophers think that the moral status of removing life supporting care is absolutely the same as the moral status of helping a patient to die through say providing um, a pill that the patient will take, or even perhaps um, providing a, a, a injecting a toxin, as long as the kind of consent that is given is the same. Philosophers um, tend to describe each act as a form of killing, and then to try to specify the conditions under which doing that such an act would be a morally justified killing. Many physicians describe the withdrawal of life supporting care, not as a killing, but merely as letting nature take its course. And much of the debate has sometimes been about whether these two kinds of, act, of actions um, are morally speaking on a par or whether they are fundamentally different morally speaking. And it's, I just want to um, clarify that 
Um, you could think that they are morally speaking on a par and think that both are wrong. It doesn't follow because both are morally uh, have an equal status that both are right. But it does follow if there is an equal status to them, that if you think that assisted suicide is immoral, then you would be committed to thinking that much of the practice over the last couple of generations of what goes on every day in American hospitals is immoral. And so the argument philosophers often give here is to start with the premise that withdrawal of care is morally permitted, then to press that, mor that withdrawal of care is morally the same as assisted suicide and to conclude that assisted suicide is at least in principle morally permitted. The practical question of um, finding regulations that will forestall abuses would still be out there, but that would be the way to resolve the issue of principle. Now I'll turn it over to you, Lenny. Yeah. So as you know, the um, there's morals, there's the psychology, and now I'll come back to the morals, but the psychology is for, for healthcare providers, as, as you've pointed out, feel very differently about withdrawing treatment um, and in a sense, letting, quote, nature take its course versus actively intervening to cause the death of a person. Um, so that's that's from this psychological, and you'll hear that all the time, the different degrees of moral distress that healthcare providers will feel over those two different options. But from a philosophy perspective, I think intent matters. And um, your right to autonomy and the, the patient with decisional capacity who asks me to have their ventilator removed is basically it has the right to non-interference. I don't want this foreign body in me, take it out. And in a sense, they have that right not to have, they have a right to bodily integrity and not to be interfered with. The person who's asking me to supply medication so that they can kill themselves don't have the right to force me to do something that I don't think is right. So I think intent matters and um, and what it requires from the physician also matters. So I don't necessarily think that they're the same, even morally. So intent may matter, but I guess the argument that they are the same is that each represents the intentional initiation of a causal chain that you know will lead to the death of the patient. Um, and what makes that permissible, if it, does, if it is permissible, is that the patient um, has decisional capacity and understands what's going on and has said that's what he or she wants. They do differ, I agree, in that there is um, what legal philosophers call a claim right that the patient has to have the um, life supporting machinery withdrawn and therefore it is obligatory on clinicians to do so. There is only a liberty right to ask for assistance in suicide and therefore it is not um, uh, required or obligatory for, for physicians um, to, um, to assist, but it is permitted. And so that, and that's where the fact that each counts as um, a killing that can be justified by the patient's consent comes in. Um, that, show, that makes it the case that it's at least permissible in each case to initiate that causal chain. I agree with you that because the patient um, has a further right um, to be free of machinery invading their body, that is not merely permissible in that case, but obligatory. But as long as it's permissible for physicians to assist in suicide, then it is true that patients who are in an institution where no physician, physician is willing to do that will be in a bad way. Um, but that's sometimes true with all sorts of procedures. Um, that, and um, the, the main question here is um, the moral permissibility for physicians to aid in this respect. So let me push a little bit. So I would ag agree that it's morally obligatory to remove the ventilator when a person with decisional capacity says that they don't want to have this intervention happening to them. The um, Assuming that full decisional capacity got that, well, it may and well, it may be morally permissible for someone to aid and abet a patient by providing uh, 
medication so that they can die. I'm not clear that that should be the role of physicians. We want, our, we want to know that our physicians have this fiduciary obligation to do what's in our medical best interest. And it might not be a good thing to expand our power, which is pretty broad as it is, to say, so therefore you have the right to abet any killings as long on the basis of a liberty right. So maybe there ought to be somebody who can provide that type of medication, but does it need to be a physician? So I guess I don't have a strong view about that. Um, I think that frequently, certainly the patient who asks for assistance in dying does believe it's in her medical best interest to die. And in that sense, just as the patient who asks for withdrawal of the ventilator believes it's in her best interest. So I'm not sure that the cases are different with regard to um, a patient's best interest. If there is, uh, and, 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 and since I do think that each of these actions is, in terms of its most accurate description, uh, a form of justified killing, I'm not sure that we um, aren't sort of blinkering our blinkering ourselves to the ways in which physicians already do that. All that said, I don't see that there's a matter of principle here as to um, what the um, sort of professional badge is of the person who is knowledgeable about pain control and so on and so forth in helping someone to die. If it would make sense to, to have um, some sub um, specialty that's not physicians, but uh, very narrowly trained, but effectively trained thanatologists, um, I, that, I, I, I would see no problem with that as long as the training um, is appropriate so that death comes painlessly. So we've gone from the right to assisted dying to a right to dying in the way that we want to die, um, which is different to say that I have a right to die painlessly. Um, it's a very modern concept. The, um, but I'm more st struggling with the idea of the concept of what is the good physician and what are the physician's obligations. And I do worry uh, when we start expanding it to say the physicians. So here's my problem. Uh, patients come and they're sick and they're suffering and they're in pain. And my obligation is to help them. And uh, at some point they may decide that the benefits of life are, are um, outweighed by all of their pain and that they're, they no longer want to pursue um, aggressive treatment and things of that sort. So they have the right to ask me to withdraw treatments. But it's, it's just really problematic if someone walks into my office and I have, well, you have the option of treatment A, treatment B, or we can just give you some pills and you can go home and die. I don't know that I want my physician to to be offering that to me and um, or at what time they should be offering it. Because again, they may be offering it way too early or by the time they're offering it, it, it may be way too late. But the question still comes of whether they're the ones who should be offering it to me or whether that really should be something outside of the field of medicine so that we can trust that our physicians are really here to, to help us promote life and to relieve suffering, but not to kill us. I just, so, um, yeah, please, go ahead. Please. I just don't, I, I know that you like to use the word that it's a justified killing with, with removing the uh, ventilator. The fact is ventilators don't always end up in a quote, justified killing. Sometimes the, the patient survives and that's not a bad ending. It's a so, bad ending if I give you pills and they don't work and you end up suffering. So, I mean, I, I think this question of whether legalizing assisted suicide would change for the worse patients' attitudes towards their physicians is a real one. And about that, there, you know, there are enough jurisdictions, both in the United States and around the world, that permit assisted suicide, that it should be possible um, to start actually answering that question. And I completely agree that if permitting assisted suicide were to change patients' attitudes towards their physicians for the worst, that would be a reason to find some other 
profession or um, so, um, to, to, to perform that role. So that just strikes me as an empirical question, and I, 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 I hope it can be started start to be answered. Wait, wait, I wait, want wait also two different... To, okay. I simply want to acknowledge that um, it's extraordinarily easy for me and extraordinarily hard for you as a physician where I am not um, to be talking about these things. It is not the case that I will ever be called upon to write an order either um, to uh, withdraw care um, or to assist in a death. That is just not what philosophers do. Um, so physicians and, never withdraw care. We withdraw treatments. We always provide care. So enough. just want to, the, the language matters the in language, this case. Language does matter, but you, you, you the, were going um, to say. Yeah, so I, I, I want to push back because it's not going to be easy to collect data from all over the world. We're a country, we're a very device, divided country right now. We, the structural racism that pervades our history and our present can't be denied or ignored. And my concern is that we already have a huge loss of trust in many, in science experts, in healthcare providers, and the idea that this one of my armamentariums is that I can go and directly kill you. Um, if I'm worried about trust, I've just brought it to the lowest levels. If the patient says, ah, maybe you're going to try to help me, but maybe you're also going to just try and kill me. So I actually think it's critically important um, that we acknowledge this. And so that when we think about what type of data, it's not going to count necessarily data from other countries. However, to the extent that we want to look at other countries, the one thing we can see is the Netherlands, which has the most aggressive degree of uh, euthanasian physician assisted suicide, we've seen a slippery slope. It started with just competent individuals, and then it went to people who were previously competent, and it's now gone to the level where we allow, that uh, in the Netherlands, it's allowed to have physician assisted suicide of young children, including infants, um, who their parents have deemed to be in, in chronic irreversible pain and discomfort. So. Um, so one, I have a concern of trust, and two, I have a real concern that it's going to go way further than just that competent patient that you're arguing has this liberty so, right to, to be killed. So this actually, there's you know an old legal metaphor about talking about the laboratory of the states, to, um, suggesting that um, it's a good thing that we have a federal system and that different states do things differently because then we can see what does and doesn't work. And while Netherlands is um, not one of our states, the same thought applies and that there are clearly abuses in the Netherlands. Canada has um, now legalized assisted suicide and there are issues there. And so that just goes to um, you know, where we started. Even if, these thing, if this works in principle, we're going to have to think about whether there are effective rules for regulating it. And um, that, in a field that's still very new, we are still debating whether some rules are too easy and some rules are, are, um, are too tough is simply to be expected. Um, so we have fairly tough rules, um, say, in Oregon uh, and fairly lax rules in the Netherlands. And I think that you know, we should be asking ourselves um, where the proper middle ground is um, for that. So I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by what happens in the Netherlands, um, but I, it doesn't make me think that it's therefore impossible to craft acceptable rules. Um, I do want, though, because we're, our time is scarce, to, to note another issue that arises in the context of assisted suicide, an issue of political philosophy. Because Laney and I have thus far been talking about whether it is um, morally acceptable to assist um, in helping someone to end their life. And that's um, not quite the same question as whether it's acceptable for the law to prohibit doing so, and in fact, to criminalize doing so, such that someone who does assist in suicide goes to jail. Um, and there is an argument that in a diverse democracy, regardless of what you think of the moral permissibility of assisted suicide, it would be wrong for the government to forbid it on principle. The government may regulate it to prevent abuses, but the government has no business deciding the matter of principle. And that's because, um, or so goes this argument, um, 
the decision to end one's life in a certain way is a very private decision. It goes to what the individual finds most important in life and how to live and die with meaning in life. And the only possible reason that the government could have for saying that doing so is in principle wrong would be if the government has a view about what's most important in life, or if the government takes a religious perspective that says something like this is wrong. And in a liberal democracy, that is simply not a role for the government to have. Um, we see this in the prohibition on established religion, and it is the same thought. And when it comes to what's most important in human life, um, the government should be neutral. And so it fails to be neutral in that way when it forbids assisted suicide and indeed brings its coercive power to bear through the criminal law um, on the basis of the thought that assisted suicide is per se wrong. That still leaves open, as I say, the question of regulation, and it is completely appropriate for the government to um, regulate activities so that they are not abused, so that, for instance, um, patients or people are not uh, uh, on, you know, pressured to ask for assisted suicide, when that's not what they really want. So that the question of regulation remains open. But, um, it, uh, but from the standpoint of the political philosopher, um, that's all the government may do. It may only regulate, not prohibit. So I, I just want to press a little bit. While it may be that government shouldn't interfere in a right to suicide, that you get to choose how you die, um, it may, I, I guess I'm just not as convinced that it's about a right to be aided in suicide. So I, I think the fact that it used to be a crime to commit suicide was problematic and that we've gotten rid of that as a crime is the right thing. The government shouldn't interfere. But it's the issue of aid, because my question from a government perspective would be, whose aid can you demand or request. And if I write a letter which says I gave my husband 100% authority to kill me, and isn't that convenient because yesterday I signed, you know, um, I guess a year and a day ago, I, I signed, you know, a life insurance policy of $5 million or something of that sort, we would have a problem with it. So I guess I would think that the government has a right to regulate who can assist in dying, even if they can't stop me from committing suicide. Oh, we don't disagree there. Illegal. I, I totally agree that, that um, precisely what regulations are sensible would take us into the, into the weeds. But I don't doubt that the government has not only is permitted, but ought to regulate the practice of assisted suicide. Um, the, 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 philosoph the political philosopher's point is that's all it may do. It may not prohibit flatly. It may not. It may simply say, um, as with many areas, we want to make sure that um, people are making free and fair and unpressured choices. And for that, um, the government may have to step in. Now, um, we should start to wrap up. So, uh, because we need to go to the Q and A. But please, let, why don't you, you you should wrap us up on this? Well, well, I actually I just want to push back again. So the government, um, the, the, there should be. A, 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 I think we just have to distinguish between a right to suicide and a right to aid in suicide. Um, and I'm just not convinced that the government shouldn't be incredibly, almost dictatorial about restricting, if it wants to, the aid to suicide, um, acknowledging, though, that we can't decide what is a good life and government doesn't have the right to impose religious views about the meaning of death, but that's about suicide. That's not about the aid of suicide because it can regulate that its citizens cannot kill each other, even if they wear a white coat. So we could clearly go on a long, long time about these things, but I think uh, it's now time um, to turn things over to Dean Robertson and, and, and um, hear some questions. Thank you so much, Dan and Lainey, for such a thought-provoking conversation. Your discussion has given me, and I'm sure everyone else, a lot to think about. So again, to the audience, we're very eager for your questions. Please send them to us using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We already have uh, quite a few questions, and I'll start with a couple that have to do with the second half of our program on assisted suicide. Um, first question. An attendee writes, 
I would appreciate it if you could address a case involving the obligations of children to parents. A parent has had advanced dementia for a long time. The dementia started 15 years ago after a heart attack and has progressed. And currently the the person lives uh, the life of a four month old in a board and care facility where she gets compassionate, good care. This parent is taking no medication and has only palliative care. Her children know that she would never have wanted to end up this way. Now the question, do we, the children, as her caregivers, have any power to end her suffering or our suffering? To describe the case more fully, the patient does not speak and wiggles her teeth until they come out, has to be fed because she doesn't recognize food, and spends her day sitting in a wheelchair in front of a TV or bed. Lenny, I'm going to let you start with this because you know better than I the rules. So. Oh. The first thing I hear a story like that, and I hope everybody leaves this um, session and make sure that they have a durable power of attorney for health care, where they have made clear what their wishes would be in the end of life, particularly if their end of life includes any long, prolonged period of dementia. Because if, if in my advanced directive, so as a cognitive adult with, with full capacity, I can sit here and say, that if I were at the point where I didn't recognize my children, I would want um, you to withhold food. Now, you can put it in front of me, but if I don't pick it up to eat, then that's okay. Um, And so there are ways that the family can, in a sense, uh, let this person's disease take its course. So we're doing a lot of care by um, all the care that probably getting about turning this patient about feeding this patient and things of that sort. But again, the issue is I really wanted as a first person that the, the, the competent adult has made it quite clear what their wishes would be in this situation. So all of us should be talking to our loved ones about what, what we would have wanted. And it has to be focused on what the patient, what's best for the patient from the patient's own perspective. I heard the suffering of the children and my heart goes out to the, the children. But as providers, my responsibility is to that patient. And so that patient is not suffering. Um, They may be suffering actually a dignity harm if they knew that they were in this condition, how they would feel about it. So again, please make your wishes known so that um, in a sense, it's legal and ethical to stop feeding this individual. So so, um, may I ask you, Lanny, putting the law aside, um, since we're not lawyers here. Um, it sounds as if you think that it is not only ethically permitted, but perhaps obligatory if there's an advanced directive of a certain kind for um, nutrition to be withheld from this patient. Um, if there is no such advanced directive and there's no, and while the children say, oh, we can't, we do not think that our our, our parent would have wanted to continue this way. There's no, document of any kind or no clear statement that was made to them. Um, Is it still ethical for the children to have nutrition withheld? Yeah, this this is really stressful because we're going from an advanced directive to what we call substituted judgment. This is what I think mom would have wanted if she could speak for herself. Um, It's probably still moral, but it's a lot more stressful. And that's why I said that this story should make all of us leave here and make sure that we have a very clear advanced directive that this is not, if we would not want to be fed and kept and, and prolong our dying process, because I would call this a dying process um, if we were in that situation ourselves. Um, makes it a lot easier for the children, makes it a lot easier for the providers. Um, but yes, I, I do think that um, th- that it, it's ethical, but it's just much more difficult to do than if we had a clear written advanced directive. Thank you both. Um, uh, The second question is is related to the first. Uh, How can we meaningfully provide the option for medical aid in dying for people with dementia? I I think that probably the answer is going to be similar. Um, That is, if prior to coming down with dementia, there had been, I'm now just echoing Laney, um, the patient had... uh, made out an advanced directive indicating that under certain circumstances, 
um, he or she would want nutrition withheld, um, then that could be done. Uh, if in the absence of such an advanced directive, we're once again get to this question of answering what would the patient have wanted, which is a thing that's ans- asked and answered all the time, but is a much more difficult thing to do when it comes to depriving someone of food. What's also really stressful about this is that, you know, dementia isn't like an on and off switch. It's, you know, a downhill slide. And the question is, at what point would, in a sense, would an individual want to have, you know, fluid and nutrition or feeding uh, withheld type of thing? And, uh, and that makes life very complicated because um, many people live very satisfying and fulfilling lives with mild dementia. Um, and yet, you know, when you hit it's in philosophy, it's the ever better bottle of wine, right? When do you drink that bottle of wine, knowing that at some point you might not be able to appreciate it? At what point is your dementia significant enough that at this point you, your advanced directive kicks in? And that's really problematic and difficult, which is why the data from the Netherlands is you're finding, I mean, one of the reasons for wanting physician-assisted suicide in the Netherlands was so that I don't have to take my life while I'm still relatively cognitively intact, knowing that I have this safeguard that, um, that I'll have aid in dying. So that's a real plus. And yet on the other side, um, because otherwise I might decide that I have to die much earlier while I still have control and able to to help facilitate my own death. So I struggle with this about just the timing of what it means to have bad enough dementia that somebody is ready to withhold nutrition. Yes, thank you. Uh, Returning to the conversation about organ transplants, uh, aren't general health or behavioral characteristics in allocating uh, organs uh, relevant here? For example, transplant recipients ranked by whether they engage in IV drug use or alcohol abuse. And so how is COVID vaccination status any different? So I'm going to let Lainey handle the technical question. She's very much of an expert on this. I'll just throw in one thought about the difference, which is that various kinds of substance abuse pose real puzzles about the exercise of the will. Um, uh, At what point is someone sufficiently dependent upon the uh, abused substance that it's not really fair to say that they are deliberately um, continuing um, to take it. Um, The reason that I want to focus on uh, the vaccine is because, um, as I say, it's it's, it's, um, a choice that can be made again and again, or a refusal that can be made again and again, and doesn't seem to have this structure behind it of um, well, we're not quite sure how voluntary the decision really is. I, I agree with you that the whole issue of whether some of these behaviors are voluntary, particularly since, unfortunately, people often with alcohol and drug uh, misuse disorders uh, start during early adolescence. And so exactly how voluntary it is. The transplant world um, does have criteria regarding those. Um, they've become more lenient and and more sort of respectful of the idea that we we need to understand that not all of this is voluntary. And so there's the uh, asking people to go into rehab and be six months abstinent before they'll get listed, for example, for a liver transplant with alcohol use disorder. Um, Although in the acute cases of an acute alcohol poisoning, they may actually even transplant if they think that the individual is a good candidate. So part of the answer is um, each individual in the transplant world is really has a full workup and this is one component and it is considered, um, but it's yet it's not necessarily, you know, a a flag that that makes it prohibited at all times. And and I guess I would feel the same way about the uh, the COVID vaccine that it also ought not to be just this, you know, 
you don't have it and therefore we're going to discriminate mm-hmm. against you. I should just say for anyone who's wondering, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted. It's not that I don't, I, I think that all of us should be vaccinated and boost and get the booster. It's just whether I'm willing to penalize those who disagree with me and I'm just not. Well, this, this next question kind of puts a fine point on what you just said, Lainey. I'm not sure if you and Dan would want to elaborate a bit more. Um, is it ethical to give preference to vaccinated individuals over unvaccinated individuals and the provision of scarce medical resources in general? So then a, a, ca- a case study here. What if two individuals, one vaccinated, one unvaccinated, arrive at the ER at the same moment, but there is only one ICU bed or ventilator available and both need it? Well, Dan, your answer is going to be shorter, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that this should happen, that this decision should be one that um, the, you know, the triage people in the emergency room should be making. I think there should be um, an institutional or maybe a more general health policy about this. But um, as you all will surely have seen from what I said before, my view would be that if we are able to keep all things equal and the questioner um, has done a really nice job of trying to keep all things equal, um, that yes, it would be not only permissible, but proper um, to give priority um, to the vaccinated person. First of all, I'm not sure we can ever make all other things being equal. I think the fact that the person who has refused the vaccine um, often comes from a different path than the person who's been vaccinated. Uh, Just when we look at uh, around our country, who were more hesitant versus who, who were more eager to get the vaccine. And so I'm just not sure that all things being equal really are equal. Uh, so my answer would be, if we were truly in that scarce situation, it would have to be a lottery, and I would not favor one or the other. Thank you. It's very interesting. Now, turning back to physician-assisted suicide, how is the relevant concept of uh, consent defined, and how is it determined whether a patient is mentally capable of choosing to end his or her life? And this does touch on what Laney said uh, a little bit earlier. It's a great question, right? Because um, if somebody comes in with a failed suicide attempt, um, we assume that they clearly they made it clear what their wishes were, which was to try to die. And in the hospital, the first thing we're going to do is try to resuscitate them and save their lives. So there is this notion of if you're suicidal, whether you have mental health issues that are, in a sense, blocking you from being decisional. Um, So it gets into the whole philosophical question is, is there such a thing as a rational suicide? And I think here, Dan and I would agree that there is probably a rational suicide. Um, Yes. I'll let you take over, Dan. Sure. No, we are in agreement about that. I think that the question of how it's to be decided whether a patient has the decisional capacity to make a medical, particular medical decision is a really difficult one because in principle, the way things are set up, um, you're not supposed to say that someone's poor decision-making and foolishness um, necessarily means that they don't have decisional capacity. Um, In practice, there are going to be outliers where one is very tempted to say that. So for instance, um, and Lainey and I might disagree about this. This is where my anti-paternalism comes a bit to an end. If we imagine a lovelorn 19-year-old who for some reason that Lainey will make up because she knows the medicine and I don't, is on a ventilator for three weeks, but once the three weeks pass, he'll be you know, fit as a fiddle and get on, get on with his life, but his girlfriend's just broken up with him um, and he wants to die. And there it is. He can say, please take me off the ventilator. And he's 19, so he is technically an adult. I just think it would be wrong to do that. Um, and one might describe this as saying that this is an exercise 
of medical paternalism in which you're saying to a patient who does have decisional capacity that you won't do what he requests, or you might say, deciding at 19 that it's time to die because you know your romantic relationship has broken up suggests that you don't for the moment fully have capacity. And that's why we won't do it. And I think more often than physicians sometimes are willing to acknowledge part of the difficulty in deciding whether or not a particular patient does have capacity um, is a difficulty in deciding whether a decision that you find problematic is one that does or does not show an absence of capacity. And it's not clear that we have a clear criterion, or rather I think we don't have a clear criterion or an accepted criterion for how to make that distinction case by case. Dan and I are thinking about a book right now by Jody Halpern uh, from Detached Concern to Empathy, which begins with the case of Mrs. G. Um, but very similar that there's this emotionally catastrophic event that's clouding the ability to be able to make a rational decision at that time. So I don't think we disagree, Dan. Um, I think what we need to do is have, a you know, when, when people say the first thing that when somebody says, I'm not willing to wait three weeks to go back to being a totally healthy 19 year old, the answer is until you're a competent adult and we remove the vent, I think the next thing is we're going to talk. We're going to talk a lot. And it's going to take a while before you can convince me. And hopefully I mean, I during think we're that time, for, we're going to talk for, for three, three weeks. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we have time for one final question, and uh, I have it here. Um, what are your positions on assisted suicide for patients with terminal depression? If you think that this situation is different from someone with physical terminal illness, why? And if this situation is different, why should a patient trust that a provider is capable of successfully treating their depression when the human mind is less well understood than, say, cancer? So I've been asked this. Um, whenever I talk about the issue of assisted suicide in a medical setting, psychiatrists come up to me after the talk, and they always have a patient um, who is more or less as described, and they say, so, you know, is this is it okay for me um, to find a way to help this person die. And generally, because it's illegal in the state of Illinois, the answer is, you know, you shouldn't do that here. But they, they then I want to ask the general question, whether psychiatric pain um, is any different from any other kind of pain with regard to assisted suicide. And I tend to turn the question back on them, um, which is cheating, um, but uh, I need to do that. Um, and I ask them, in their professional opinion, do they think that there is even a small possibility that this patient will either go into some kind of level of remission through therapy or that there is, could be um, new drugs that would come along that would sufficiently mitigate the pain? And generally they will say, they think there's just enough of a possibility for one or the other that they think the proper thing is to keep the patient, you know, hopeful and going on. I don't know quite what to say when, and this has happened when the psychiatrist says, not with this patient. Um, there, this patient is an utter um, agony that's unstopping. And in my profession, you know, I've, I've treated this patient for years and years and years. And in my professional opinion, there's nothing that can mitigate this. And I guess if I'm then put on the spot to ask whether I think that this could be a case where assisted suicide would be morally okay, we'll put aside the legal questions. I'm forced to admit that I think on the basis of the principles that I've been pressing here that yes, I do. But I, um, I would, this is one of those cases where the risk of abuse is enormous and so it would be important to bend very far over to try and see whether there is any hope at all for sufficient remediation of the psychological pain. It's fascinating to me because 
the fact is, is that patient um, probably has enough drugs in his or her medicine cabinet to commit suicide successfully if they have that severe type of depression and they've been getting treatment for years and years. And so in some sense, I guess, Dan, the other question I would ask the psychiatrist is that they're asking for help. Why? Are they asking for help because they want validated that if they commit suicide, they did it for quote unquote good medical reasons and that their family can't blame them? I just, why? Why are they looking for the help? So remember, I, I was one to agree with you that there might be a liberty interest in deciding that you get to decide when you die and, and you can commit suicide. Why the need for the assistance? And why, I mean, I hear that, and then I'll throw it back at you. Um, and I understand that, you know, there is a general thought that we want um, physicians and medical clinicians of all kind to be on the side of life. But when we get to somebody who's in that much pain and when the psychiatrist, after many years, you know, and, and, and you know, going deep into his or her own soul about this, really thinks that there's no hope for this patient, why is it wrong for her, again, put the law aside, to validate the patient on this? Awful, absolutely awful. I agree. But I'm, and as I say, when once the, this, this should come only after years and years of other attempts, but I'm not sure one. So in the last case, we were paternalistic for three weeks and this one yeah. were years and years. Yeah, right. Um, I just, it stresses me that they need this validation. Okay. Because they have the access. So really interesting point. Well, this has been a marvelous discussion. I want to thank the audience for such uh, thoughtful questions and thank you for really insightful responses, Dr. Laney and philosopher Dan. And um, again, uh, for the fascinating conversation, I think the back and forth was really quite uh, stimulating and, and just perfectly pitched at, at every turn. So let me thank all of you again for attending tonight's session and for the provocative and thoughtful questions again that you asked. Um, and I'd like to tell you about a couple of our upcoming events. Uh, I hope you will join us for this year's Berlin Family Lectures. <clears throat> the Berlin Family Lectures enrich and extend the scholarly reach of the University of Chicago and the Division of the Humanities by providing the university community with access to the world's best thinkers, those recognized with a global reputation for scholarship in their area of specialty, including the humanities, arts, social sciences, and more. This year, we're delighted to welcome the renowned poet and essayist, Claudia Rankine, who will deliver three stimulating lectures on April 6th, April 13th and April 14th, so please mark your calendars. Uh, and in addition, we'll hold our spring Dean Salon later this year. In this salon, we plan to examine the potential and limits of artificial intelligence and computational ideas to help us understand the human mind. We're still firming up the details, but we will have more to announce soon, and please look for an invitation in your inbox. Thank you all again for joining us this evening. Keep safe and warm, and I hope to see you again very soon.